Hello and welcome to a brand new series. Uh, this is Sacred Heart Apologetics and my name is Shabal Raish, Director of Perusia and joining forces with the founder of Sacred Heart Media, Raymond D'Souza in the United States. We are bringing to you um, for the next nine months a brand new podcast going through not only the 12 promises of the Sacred Heart following the promise that Jesus said, if those who devote themselves to the first Fridays of every month for nine months, he has these promises attached, which we'll discuss throughout this series. And so it's symbolic we're going for nine, but also we want to introduce apologetics. And so we're going to go through it systematically, starting with today's month on relativism. What is truth? And Raymond is an expert in apologetics, the founder of the largest apologetics by mail course in history, over 67 lessons, 68 actually. And this was, this was mailed out to people. It's now uh, available on Perusia Media in digital form. So go to our website, www.perusiamedia.com, and you can see uh, one of the longest apologetic series um, ever produced by mail. And so Raymond uh, was instrumental in that. He's also an author of the King Henry uh, the Eighth book, uh, Defense of the, um, the Defense of the Seven Sacraments, as he wrote the um, revision there and re reprinted it. But also uh, he's got a number of DVDs and CDs, and also MP3s, again, all available on our website. I, I'd like to call him a good friend of mine. It's been over 20 years since I first met Raymond, 22 years now, and uh, he's been such a great apologist for the Catholic faith. He is now with me. Hello, Raymond. Are you excited for this brand new series? Yes, Charbel, that is, that is very great. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to um, be part of this effort that will be international, to reach a number of the countries, uh, and I'll be delighted to be part of it. It is uh, like to greet all the friends in Australia. I used to live there uh, some years ago, and uh, not New Zealand as well, in Canada, in, uh, but I am Brazilian by birth. I lived in Brazil for until my 25th anniversary, and then I moved over overseas. And uh, I'm delighted to be with you folks. And please, God, you're going to have a good exercise to understand better the promise of the sacred heart of Jesus and also the apologetics of uh, the church. Fantastic. Now, we are an international uh, audience, and just you and between you and I alone, there's so many countries we represent. I am born and raised in Australia, um, but my mother is from Lebanon. My father's from Colombia in South America. So we have family across the world. And I'm in Australia right now. You are in the United States now, but as you say, born in Brazil, but you lived in multiple countries. And I remember you in Australia, but of course, New Zealand was one of them. South Africa was another one. And I'd like to uh, welcome any South Africans watching. Um, any other countries you were at? I know France was another one. I lived, I lived in France and also I lived in, in Canada. And um, I've traveled, I work with the Human Life International, the largest the pro-life Catholic Association in the world. We have um, affiliates in about over 100 countries. Wow. And I am the delegate for international missions. So I, I travel. I've been to about 38 countries of the planet, <laughs> giving talks, uh, uh, giving, uh, defending the culture of life and combating the culture of death that today is spreading all over the world. Yes. We need you out there. And you also uh, speak in multiple languages, not just English. Uh, what are the other languages that you speak in? Yes, uh, I currently speak on uh, in Portuguese, which is my native language. I'm Brazilian, and I also give talks in uh, Spanish to the countries of Latin America through Human Life International, and I also speak in French, which I use only in Canada. It's the only place where I can speak French uh, or France as well. But I, I have not given much, much I have not had much work there in France. So mainly. These ones and are now brushing up Italian. So uh, I don't think there will be an, a great need for the Italian language, but just because it's, it's, it's a beautiful language, it's fun. So I'm learning that. Um, now, uh, Sacred Heart Media, let's talk about that first very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then you, you do have a, a very strong devotion to the Sacred Heart. But Sacred Heart Media is, a, is a, an apostolate that you founded in the United States. What, yes. is, what does it aim to do? What do you do with Sacred Heart Media? The main goal of Sacred Heart Media is to promote the knowledge and the love of the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Unfortunately, it's very little known, even here in the States. 
We know the Sacred Heart, we know the pictures, the, the, the Sacred Heart in statues. But what did he say in the revelations to St. Margaret Mary Lacoque? We we'll know just basically that. And so uh, I have uh, the 12 promises that he made to St. Margaret Mary Lacoque that uh, I have given on EWTN television a uh, series of 13 uh, presentations, one overview and the other 12. I take each promise and basically two it up and apply to down to concrete things. And then after that, I did uh, also on CD, which is about one hour each one of them. And um, we promote these, uh, these CDs and these, uh, to encourage people to know and love the sacred heart of Jesus. Not just the, the idea of the image or invite or invoking him, but also to know in greater depth. Because as Pope Pius IX, he was nicknamed the Pope of the Sacred Heart. He pointed out that uh, devotion to the Sacred Heart is what is going to save the world. Promote everywhere this devotion. But for some reason, today is promoting very, very few Catholic circles, at least to the degree that it will be necessary, will be needed. Yes, no, so true. There is a, um, people can contact you on a website. Uh, how, if they want to know more, where do they go? Yeah, the website, uh, my, is a uh, website of Sacred Heart Media. It's called basically RaymondDSouza.com. There I have a list of 33 different topics that I address in my, in my talks. And I'm free to visit any country in the free world and uh, in any of the four languages, uh, Portuguese, French, Spanish, and, uh, and uh, English dealing with these, uh, the sacred heart of Jesus. Yeah, but the, uh, today we talk about the, the first promise of the sacred heart. Wonderful. Um, I have, um, first of all, give a bit of a summary. In the 1600s, when um, Luther in, broke the unity of Christendom in the 15th century, in the 1500s and then plus, our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque after Luther in order to remake Christendom, the social political structure of the Christian world. And he gave a message to the king of France, who was uh, Louis XIV. Our Lord spoke to the nun, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, and said, tell the king to do four things. I'm summarizing. First of all, you should, uh, the king, you should uh, depict the Sacred Heart on the flag on the standards of France. Easy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you should uh, build a chapel in Versailles dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Three, you should consecrate yourself, your family, and your kingdom to the Sacred Heart. And four, that's very interesting, you should ask the Pope that he may approve a Mass for the Sacred Heart, which in those days did not exist. It, it only came afterwards. If we did that, if the king did that, there will be a renewal of devotion in France, a reconquering of the souls from Protestantism into the Catholic Church again, and uh, there will be a, a renewal of Christendom. Needless to say that um, the king did not do it. It is... Um, God gave us free will, and he preferred to mind his own business. And as a result, exactly 100 years later, to the day, his uh, descendant, Louis XVI, was sent to the guillotine. And the Catholic monarchy of France, the medieval Catholic monarchy, disappeared. As a result, it was restored later on, but it was not the same. And the interesting thing is that uh, in France, I read the testimony, the, the last will of Louis XVI before he went to the guillotine, in which he promised to our Lord Jesus Christ that he would be, he would do everything he said. He would build the chapel, depict the standard, etc., etc., but it was too late. He went from prison to the guillotine because God takes very seriously our lack of seriousness. As a result, Protestantism remained and it spread throughout Europe, and then in the colonies of, of the Europeans, which is in the Americas and Australia, etc., etc. These, uh, But our Lord gave St. Margaret Mary 
12 promises. We deal today with only the first one. When he said, uh, I will give you the graces necessary for your vocation in life. Now, two things to bear in, bear in mind. First of all, what are our vocations in life? The most common one is marriage. Every person, most people are called to, to marriage and to have a children. Be fruitful and multiply, he said to Adam and Eve. That's it. That's the uh, well-known. But for marriage, and for, to make a family, you must understand, a family is uh, indissoluble. Divorce is not acceptable by our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, monogamic. In the Old Testament, because of the hardness of their hearts, Moses allowed polygamy. But the days of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, no. And must, marriage must be between one man and one woman together having children, or at least open to have children. What we have today here in America, and probably in Australia as well, and elsewhere, the so-called homosexual unions, which is a catastrophic uh, reality against the family. Actually, two weeks ago, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome declared it's clearly God cannot bless sin because homosexuality is a sin, a mortal sin, a sin against nature. It's not, a, it's not any kind of, there are one of the four sins that cry out to God for vengeance. We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Huh? This, this is the family. And our Lord promises to bless the family when the husband and wife together have a great devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. He promises to give them the graces for their union. Then you have uh, people who go to become uh, um, religious, to join a congregation. And it is a, an, an act of, uh, an, of more, a greater perfection. They make vows of, um, of poverty, chastity, obedience. Even the Carmelites do a fourth vow, the vow of cloister, where they stay locked up for life. And uh, our Lord also promises, if those nuns and those men, those monks, are the true devotees of the sacred heart, he promises to give them the graces necessary for, the, for a successful religious life. Then we have another vocation, which is the priesthood, which is the highest of the lot. When one is a few, few men, because priesthood is not a human right, it's a privilege that the, some men are called to a higher vocation, to act in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. When the priest is celebrating Mass, or when he's up hearing confessions, he is there in the person of Jesus Christ. That's an incredible vocation. And uh, then we have a last one, which is a consecrated secularity. People who are neither married, nor priest, nor, nor monk, nothing, but they live a life dedicated to the service of the church, to serve the, of, the, of their neighbors. People from the Legion of Mary, the Apostleship of Prayer, there are so many vocations that are like this. So he promises to give us the grace. But what is grace? Let's uh, chew up a little bit this concept. Pope uh, Benedict XVI, in the encyclical at um, Sacramentum Caritatis, he was grieved when he said that today there are people who do not live in a state of grace, who don't consider it important. So uh, they are comfortable in a life of sin. Now, what is grace then? It is a supernatural gift created by God that enable us to participate in the very life of the Blessed Trinity. When St. Paul said, uh, I live, no, not I, but Christ lives in me. That was the life of grace in him. And we are called to be like that, to have the very life of God himself. Something that uh, Lucifer wanted to be like God and failed because he did that out of uh, pride. Likewise, Adam and Eve messed up, but we can do it by simply cooperating with divine grace. Our Lord received our nature, assumed our human nature in our Blessed Mother, and we are called also 
no, not to become gods, but to become somehow divinized by living the same life of God our Lord. We have this, uh, the problem is uh, life in the, as a prophet Job says in the Old Testament, life is a fight. And we have enemies against the life of grace in us. These enemies can be uh, external and internal. The internal enemies, to, no, the external ones are the typical ones, the devil, the flesh, and the world. Exactly the three temptations that Jesus suffered in the desert. The temptation of the flesh was when he wanted to satisfy his hunger, his physical needs. The devil said, uh, tell these uh, stones to become bread. Temptation of the world. When you want to be applauded by mankind, by the circles in where, where we live. And the devil said to our Lord, jump off this uh, pinnacle of the temple and you will alight there and the people are going to acclaim you, etc., etc. And the third is the devil. He said, adore me. So we have the same situation. When we worship the world, we become politically correct. We try to follow the opinion of other people. When we have a, a temptation of abandoning God, which in, in fact means we are following the devil, following Satan. So uh, these are the enemies of the life of grace in us. The internal enemies are more subtle. They, uh, it's like I call the, uh, the lame Catholic. We know what a lame duck is, huh? but <laughs> what's a lame Catholic? L-A-M-E. L for lukewarm, A for apathetic, M for mediocre, E for erratic. These are the enemies that we have within us that prevent us from living the life of divine grace. L, lukewarm. So many times we see, for example, in the pro-life uh, work, there are people who are neither hot nor cold, neither in favor nor against. They couldn't be bothered. That's why the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 3, verse 15, says that Jesus will vomit them out of his mouth. Wow. Then a apathetic, people whose sensibility is numb, uninterested about anything. When we hear about the concentration camps in China, the persecution of the church there, couldn't be bothered. This is a, what afflicts so many Catholics today. They have the mediocre. Mediocrity are the people who uh, the vision of reality is that small and they can see only the problems that are right in front of them, unable to see what the, uh, the revolution is doing in the world. Actually, mediocrity, when uh, we look at the uh, a constellation, say um, the, um, uh, the big bear here in North America and the, and the Southern Cross in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, and you point at them and say, look how beautiful it is. And a mediocre man look at your finger and say, well, what's so special about it? And finally, erratic. One who attends a, a talk, who attends a, a, a conference, and then he's so excited about defending the faith, but the following morning, he forgot everything. He's erratic. These are the enemies we have to fight. Now, to summarize, Jesus said, learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. The difficulty with us Catholics today that we misunderstand this teaching. We confuse meekness with weakness and humility with mediocrity. That is not the way. At another time, I'll be, I'll be talking about the armor of God that St. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, he describes the armor of God that every Catholic, every Christian should wear to the defense of the faith. Right. This is the uh, summary of the first, uh, the first promise of the sacred heart, that we should, we are called to be with our Lord Jesus Christ Excellent. to promote his devotion. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, there's going to be 11 more that we're going to go through over the next eight months. So we have to, there'll be a couple of uh, weeks where we'll have to combine some and go through two promises. Um, but thank you. That's, that's how I want to start each of these episodes 
Um, but we want to move now into apologetics, Raymond, yeah. and talk about relativism right now. And this will be our first theme of this first month. You know, the idea of truth, can there be such thing as objective truth? And these days, as you know, uh, we see a lot, many people say, well, look, that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. That might be your truth, but it's not my truth. And many people make up what they believe is true, according to them, and all of a sudden, we don't have anything consistent, no, no foundation to build up. Um, can you comment now, where do we begin in a culture that has thrown away this idea of objective truth? How do we know that there is such thing as truth? And, yeah, let's, let's work through these arguments. Yes. First of all, uh, I remember when Pope Benedict XVI, or Cardinal Ratzinger at that time, he, uh, in, his, uh, in the election, in the, the conclave that elected him Pope, he, in, this, in the uh, homily of the Mass, which I recommend everyone to please go to the Vatican website, and download the homily of Cardinal Ratzinger at the Mass of the Conclave that he elected him Pope. He spoke about the dictatorship of relativism. Mm. Now, let's analyze this. It seems to be a kind of a contradiction because when, when you speak of a dictatorship, you think of um, uh, one man or a small group of men who impose their will on everybody. But when you speak of relativism, it's exactly the opposite. When every Tom, Dick, and Harry yet have their own idea, what should be. But there's no contradiction here. Cardinal Ratzinger was right. There is a dictatorship that imposes on us. You have to be relativist. You have to have your own truth, and you must never criticize somebody else's truth. Mm -hmm. If the, uh, we must accept everybody's view, and you are supposed to do this. That's a dictatorship. It is a... Interesting, because they leave a contradiction and they impose that on, uh, on people. And unfortunately, so many, so many young people at universities, they fall for this. And then they are complete, they become uh, lame ducks for the uh, wrong doctrines that the devil uh, inspire in them. Okay, um, who asked this question, what is truth? It was Pontius Pilate. He said to Jesus, quid es veritas, what is truth? And he never waited to, to hear the reply. He just walked off. Jesus could have said to him, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Or he could have given him a more philosophical uh, uh, explanation. Truth is the uh, agreement between the mind and reality. Let's see a few examples. In Australia, we have the... Um, um, Ayers Rock. You say pro pronounce Ayers, Ayers, right? Ayers Rock. That's right. Ayers Rock. <laughs> Must be most Australian. Okay. <laughs> Here in America, we have the Mount Rushmore with those foreheads uh, carved. Mm. If somebody says uh, there is no Mount Rushmore, he is wrong because reality shows that there is a Mount Rushmore. And in Australia, there is an Ayers Rock. Yes. But I don't believe there is, for example. Well, tough luck for you because it does exist. It's not a matter of opinion. It is the, not the mind, the individual mind, that makes the, the uh, truth, but the reality. You take, for example, um, if somebody says to you, um, you know, the, I, I had a dream the other day. It was a city that had no streets. There was water in the city. It cannot exist. And I say, yes, it can. It does exist. It's called Venice. Yes. I have been there. Of course. So it does not matter what you think. That now oh, this is rubbish. No, it does not matter at all. It does exist. I was there. We can multiply. Well, I don't think that fire is, a, is, is bad, in, say, for example, in a, in a paper factory. You should not uh, lit a fire because everything's going to burn up. And I said, no, I don't think fire will burn paper. No, sorry, That's you. your opinion is wrong. Your view is wrong because it is. Take Islam, for example. Every single act of terrorism in the last 15, 20 years has been done by Islamic people. So 
No, no, I don't believe that. They are very, they are, I think they're very peaceful people. Sorry, it's not the case. <laughs> if you read their, their book, what the prophet said and the, how they fulfill your view of their prophets, that's it. When you talk about, um, say, uh, uh, Protestantism, the idea of Martin Luther, of uh, sola scriptura, is the Bible alone. That's the only truth. We don't need bishops and priests and popes and, uh, and councils. Very good. But it's not true. Because uh, there are 45,000 Protestant churches here in the United States. Can you imagine Jesus saying, uh, Peter, thou art a rock, and upon this rock I'll build my 45,000 churches? No, it did not exist that. So it is wrong. So we can apply this to every aspect of life. Truth must be the, the, the correspondence, the agreement between the mind and reality. Some people say that um, um, the Americans did not go to the moon. The whole thing was fake. Okay, either they did go or they didn't go. It cannot be a matter of opinion. If we, uh, I believe that they went, okay. If I don't believe they went, I may be wrong. So it, truth is always in the matter, in the reality. It is never only in the mind of the people. If you take, for example, our, our senses tell us the truth. I can see Venice. It is true. I can hear music. Oh, yes, that's melodious or it's ugly. I can smell things that are bad or that are good. I can taste food that is uh, spoiled. It's not a matter of opinion. We can apply this in all aspects of, of human life. But you must have clear in our minds that truth is in the agreement between the intellect and the reality. Mm. You take, for example, uh, a man who said that um, uh, fire does not burn. Okay. I said, well, I can't put to the test. It does burn. It's a reality. It burns. Or that I uh, don't believe in the law of gravity. Okay, go to the top of a building, jump off and see what happens. See if you can fly like Superman. Let's see. That's right. Or, or you can, for example, say, uh, um, I was in, uh, in South Africa and I went to the gold mines and the diamond mines there to see. And I, somebody showed to me a, um, a rough diamond. A rough diamond looks like a piece of glass. Nothing special about it. You could even you can find one and kick it out if you don't pay attention to it. But I also went to England and I saw in the tower the uh, crown jewels of Her Majesty Elizabeth II. And you see the diamond, the Kohinoor. It is the most perfect diamond, neatly cut. Now, when you see a cut diamond, you know that somebody cut it. There is no diamond mine that produces cat diamonds. No, there is one. I remember. I saw in the movie that, in that movie, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, they, uh, they work in the mine and they, 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 the diamonds are already cut. But that's a nice, beautiful fairy tale. <laughs> Whenever you see things in order, you know there is a mind behind it to do it. We have... Uh, um, you know truth by your personal experience, like the physical experience. You know that fire burns, you have seen uh, Venice. You, you know, you just know that nobody has to, uh, to, to explain to you any, any, any reasons. Uh, you know that gravity works, etc., etc. You can also know the truth by reasoning about it. For example, um, if you find uh, um, the example I gave of the, of the diamond, if I see a cut jewel, somebody did it. Somebody cut it. You take, for example, if you find in a, in a pool of water, a mini, a small um, computer chip that you use to make uh, calculators. These things are made by the millions in China. Uh, my, machines make it. Mm. So simple, so easy to make. You see that, so amazing how the, chemi the chemical elements of the water have combined together to make this chip. 
That's right. You know, you know it's somebody dropped it there. You see a watch in town in, in the forest, you know somebody dropped it there. The, the elements did not make that watch, not make that uh, chip, let alone a living cell. That's why the theory of evolution is a complete stupidity to think that from inanimate, lifeless matter, you have a living cell, which is uh, developing, you're reproducing and feeding everything else. It's crazy. But there are people today who believe in this kind of thing. It's the most anti-scientific reality possible. But there you have. You have uh, um, the, um, the example of, of the... the, the, the small chip that you find, and you can apply to anything. If you see somebody made it, then you know it is true. That truth can be known by the human mind without having to uh, come into great philosophical things. You can also understand the truth. <clears throat> Merely understanding a truth. You take, for example, I, uh, some years ago, I was in, uh, in the city of Rochester, here in Minnesota, where I live. I was giving a talk in, uh, in a coffee house, and uh, there are two atheists there, okay? And uh, I loved that. And, uh, and they, were, of course, were against God's existence. And towards the end of the talk, they were completely silent. But anyway, and uh, I said to him, look, I'm going to say something here that you will agree with me. And they said, <laughs> really? Yes, you will agree with me. You have no choice. You have to agree. And he said, okay, go ahead. And I say, you take a pizza and you have the slices. The pizza is always bigger than any of its slices. Which means the whole is always bigger than any of of its parts. They moved. <laughs> they had to agree. Another thing that it, I, something that is impossible for you to do. Please draw here a square circle. You, you, you can do it. You know what a square is. You know what a circle is. But a square circle you cannot draw. Objectively, truthfully, you cannot draw it. We can make a lots of, uh, of examples along the, 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 uh, the, the same lines. We take, for example, the, um, these truths are self-evident. We don't have to argue to show that uh, the, the whole is bigger than the past. So the truth is objective. And our human mind can understand, can, can, can have it, the concept in our minds quite, quite simply. Another time we know about... Uh, we can accept the truth and the authority of another person. That's what we, we know about the history, for example. How do I know that Captain Cook arrived in Australia and Christopher Columbus arrived here in America? I was not there to see. I didn't have to have the physical experience of it. But uh, I know through the trustworthy witnesses. I know that Jesus Christ founded the church. And uh, I know not, I, didn't, I was not there, but I know that it happened well. Actually, I had a friend in... Uh, in Sydney, right there where you are, who said to me that, uh, how do you know that Christ even existed? And I said, okay, well, you take the Gospels, the historical documents. And, oh, no, 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 those documents are, these are people who wanted to believe in him. I said, okay, there are also many authors who are not Christian, like Pliny the Younger, governor of Bithynia, who affirmed that Jesus Christ existed, was crucified. Also, Flavius Josephus, a historian from the, the, the Jews, who said that ah, 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 that could be fake, those books. <laughs> now, he wanted a proof that was physical. That's impossible. It happened 2,000 years ago. Then I said, okay, I'm going to silence this chap in no time. So listen, well, what's your father's name? He said, why? What's got to do with it? What is your father's name? And he said to us, say, Peter, so how do you know he's your father? And then he said, oh, of course, no, how do you know he's your father? You believe he's your father, but you don't know. 
And he said, oh, but my parents are fam-. Oh, of course, they, they, are, they are trying to fool you. They, they, was, they, they will not tell that you are found in the garbage. Huh? And then he said, no, I have here the, the, my birth certificate. I, I said, it could be, be fake, of course, we never know that. Now, if you cannot prove who the man who is living with your mother is your father, how can you help me to prove to you a physical proof that our Lord lived and was real 2,000 years ago? That this uh, idea of trying to find um, a physical evidence about everything, it's impossible. Mm. We know things by, by physical experience. We know things by uh, truths that are self-evident. As I have mentioned the example of the, of the, um, the whole in the pot. And you have truths, you know, by the testimony of other people. There are three ways of knowing this. Then we have the attitude of people towards the truth. You can be three ways. You can be uh, uh, a doubt, an opinion, and a certitude. A doubt. When people say, I don't know, for example, if um, how is this, do you think that Marine Le Pen will win the elections in France? I say, I don't know. Could be, could not be. I don't know. That's a doubt. It may be true, but I don't know. Then I say, uh, I may have an opinion. How do you say that uh, the American president is a good Catholic, Joe Biden? And you say, no, I think not, because uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the way he favors abortion. So, ah, but he could go to confession after every time, but that's not the way that the Catholic Church works. And then uh, I have the certitude that he has betrayed his faith. I have the certitude. And I, I'm certain that homosexual unions are evil. I'm against human nature. God created us Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And you have the, the, uh, the union between a man and a woman forms a family, not a man and a man. You can have the whole of mankind to make another huge Sodom and Gomorrah, it does not matter. It will never be true. When we have these concepts clear in our minds, it will be easier to proclaim our independence from the opinion of people today, from the political correctness of people in, in our days. We can have, for example, the uh, question of the physical certitude. I have the experience that Venice exists. I have the experience that fire burns. I have the experience that uh, uh, to, to fly between uh, the States and, and Australia is very long. I have the physical experience of this. Other times we have the uh, metaphysical certitude. When I, as I, I did this, this ex, um, presentation in a, in a college in Perth, Western Australia, when a young man came to me and said, Mr. De Souza, now I know where you're coming from. You don't believe in God. You know there is a God. So quite right. I don't believe. I believe in divine revelation. Jesus Christ, the Eucharist, the priesthood, the church, the papers. Yes, but that there is a God? I know. I know from my, just by the, uh, the physical, the uh, not even the moral certitude, just the physical and the metaphysical, I know there is a God. Actually, the second talk we have here, the second podcast, yes. will be about this, God's existence. Yeah, How do we know? Point. How do we know in our minds that there is a God who is the creator and the governor of the, mm -hmm. uh, the universe? Then we have the uh, uh, moral certitude, for example, uh, I want to know what time will the airplane leave, uh, or the, the bus will leave. I phone the, the, the uh, station and say, what time does it leave? People say at 10 o'clock. I believe it. I don't have to check with the, the judge, with the police, with the cop. No, no. You take people at, at face value in so many cases. Otherwise, life will become a madness, become important. If you don't accept anything what people say, you have to double-proof everything, we go nuts. So we have these three ways of, uh, of uh, knowing the truth. 
The opposite of it is a, what is called the skepticism. Or sometimes you say people have a skeptic mind or a septic mind when I, mm. I mispronounce the word. Those who uh, think that uh, the human mind can never know the truth. And so they live as if uh, the everything was aleatory, everything was based on luck. Of course, they, they never say that they don't need food, of course. They never say that the fact that we need food to live, that's an objective reality. And we need the air to breathe. We're dependent on air to live. And uh, if somebody removes the air, we die. That's a matter not of opinion, but of reality. Actually, when you know the, the, uh, the proofs of God's existence, we started the second law of thermodynamics. And we come to the ineluctable conclusion that there is a God. And this God's a creator. When you say that two plus two makes four, it's not a matter of opinion. If that were, it is because of arithmetics is that the basic of reasoning that you have, can develop into algebra, into geometry, in trigonometry, and then in the space uh, travel and everything else, because it is objective. When the scientists know the uh, how the um, the gravitational pull of Mercury is good to send probes over out into space, we know, they know these realities. It is incredible, it's very beautiful. I had a friend here in the States uh, many years ago, he used to work for NASA. And uh, I was fascinated to hear how those guys discover the laws of the universe. They don't make the laws, they don't invent the laws, they discover them. And that's incredibly beautiful to see how God is the governor and the lawmaker of the, the universe. Let me finish with this. There's a basic principle of human sanity, mental sanity, called the principle of non-contradiction, which says nothing can be and not be at the same time and from the same point of view. Let it sink in. Nothing can be and not be at the same time from the same point of view. <laughs> to say that it's so... It's insane. In my opinion, I think that uh, the light is on, you think it is off, and that's it. No, nothing can be and not be at the same time. Uh, the, the famous uh, sentence of uh, Hamlet, when he said, um, to be or not to be, that's the question. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's to right. be or not to be, that's the question. And if today we see that... Uh, not only there is a God, but the Jesus Christ, the Son of God incarnate. And uh, he founded a specific church upon Peter, the, the prince of the apostles. And this church exists to the This is a reality. If um, yes. Jesus made things according to people's opinion, then uh, we have insanity. That's why today so many people, so many people here in the States, to speak only of America, commit suicide because the uh, things don't make sense to them. It reminds me of a, of a man who was in a, in, a, in a madhouse, in an asylum, and he was always pulling a, a, an empty um, sardine can. And he said it was his doggy, Toto. Huh? And uh, whenever he spoke to the doctors, to the people in charge of the hospital, they asked him, what is, have you got that? Oh, that's my doggy Totos. Okay, go back to your room. He was not, until one day, he came in and with the, the, the sardine can, and the doctor said to him, what is, uh, have you got that? Oh, that's a, an empty sardine can. Ah, good. He's healed. You can go. He went out. When he was outside of the asylum, he said, see, Toto, we fooled him, didn't we? And we moved on. Now, it is not a matter of opinion. It is today the assassination of the intellect. When people believe what others say, or when people believe because they have a whim, they have a, a preference, as a result, we have the death of this, this, the body and the death of the soul in so many cases. So it is important for those of us who are Catholics, to maintain the clarity of thinking. 
the truth is objective, never subjective. When it is subjective, it's a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of reality. Truth then, to summarize, is the uh, agreement between the idea and the reality. If my idea corresponds to the reality, my idea is true. If my idea does not correspond to reality, my idea is false. In this way, we'll be able to, God willing, uh, cleanse our minds from the dictatorship of relativism, which uh, Cardinal uh, Ratzinger you yes. spoke of in the, uh, in the Vatican. Just give, give you some link. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond. There's a lot to think about there. And we, we can know for certain there is such thing as objective truth. We've, we've clarified it there. And, and uh, it's rock solid. Um, this, this gives us the foundation, um, as you say, for next, next month when we go into then uh, what is true, what is, what is false, and ha according to who is something true. There's also this concept of the maker. <laughs> and, the, um, yes. and so uh, you touched a little bit on good and evil there as well and what's right, what's wrong. So that'll be interesting. Now, once we discover that there is a creator, in the universe who is good, we're going to really unpack a lot more of this. So very excited about the next eight months ahead of us. Um, so this this month, uh, for all those watching, you can use this and watch this over and over again. It's completely free. Um, you can share this among your family and friends. It is both across uh, all the different platforms we have on Facebook, uh, premiering there, premiering on YouTube, on the Perusio YouTube channel. It is within our Perusia world and, of course, across the social media with uh, sacred media as well. Look across all those platforms. And if you have not yet signed up for anything, if you've got friends you want to share this with, please do so. And then visit our website both at raymondasouza.com and at perusiamedia.com to know more. If you'd like to book Raymond for a talk, he's available uh, anywhere in the world. But it, those in America particularly right now as uh, uh, things are opening up slowly, um, you can get Raymond to speak. Uh, many of those uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, parishes and, and any other language um, Raymond can give talks. Uh, and we are looking forward to getting you to Australia again, Raymond, one day, and New Zealand, of course. <laughs> yes. Actually, um, there is one thing that I must do, that um, the, for the development of Catholic apologetics that I have promoted in the last 30 years of my life, I owe this encouragement to one man in Brazil, Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira. He founded the TFP Society in Brazil. He was the one who uh, helped me to think with clarity, mm. with uh, objectivity, and uh, always a profound love and reverence and service to our Holy Mother Church. That is something that today, the love of the church is evaporating, so to speak. When we see so many scandals happening here in America, just to speak of one element is the, the spread of homosexuality among the clergy. It's uh, unthinkable that we have here. That man, uh, John uh, Martin. J James, Jeffrey, James Martin. James Martin, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. He uh, is speaking all over the place, favoring homosexuality. There are bishops, there are cardinals here who are in favor of homosexuality. Thank God the... Uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith closed the debate. And that's why the church in uh, Germany is becoming schismatic and going to leave the, the Catholic Church because they are completely against the teaching of, of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ and of human nature. So um, I'm very grateful to Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira for the uh, method of thinking that he uh, promoted and I benefited to some extent. I'm a very bad student of an excellent school, but such is life. I would like to uh, acknowledge that. Thank you, Will do. Thank you to him. Um, may he be, he, he's passed away now. Um, and so his legacy is living on. And thank you for uh, being, picking up the baton, as we say, and, and continuing uh, the teaching of authentic truth. Um, we to, are, one uh, thing I want to yes. add, is that uh, I'm also a, a Knight of Malta. And the, yeah, what, uh, the what Knight, is a Knight of, Malta? of Malta? Knight of Malta has a, for was started 900 years ago in the Holy Land. They began as a hospital, uh, hospitalers. And uh, once the Muslims began to uh, 
killed the, the, the men and kidnapped the women and the children. They got the sword and began to fight as crusaders. And we had a fantastic story in the last 900 years. Today, they, they have changed the uh, weapons from sword and shield to the pen and the wood. And they have two purposes. One, the uh, tuitio fide, or the defense of the faith. And two, obsequium pauperum, the assistance to the poor and the sick. There are many, many hospitals today, many help that the uh, Knights of Malta provide. And uh, I am one of those who provide the uh, tuitio fide, the defense of the Catholic faith. That is something we need to do, defend the faith, defend our Holy Mother Church, and uh, defend our Lord Jesus Christ, who is now being blasphemed and attacked in all sorts of ways. That's why we were confirmed. We became soldiers of Christ when we were confirmed. Oh, and a soldier right. exists to fight. That's the idea. Let us fight this good fight, right to the yes. day of uh, dying uh, breath. And that's what we attempt to do here, to try and present the truth to people in as many ways as possible across whatever means possible. And, uh, and I want to thank you for your dedication and commitment. We are only one down. There's, there's eight to go. And so uh, over the nine months, so these are the first Fridays over nine months. And there is a, a deliberate reason why we're doing nine, Raymond, um, that it is linked to a promise that Jesus made. Uh, and it has to do with the Sacred Heart, um, uh, the idea of oh, First yeah. Friday devotion. Um, very quickly as we close, and maybe people can pick up as of today, as they're watching this, to, to make a commitment today as the first of the nine Fridays. Not only watch this show <laughs> and this series, <laughs> but what else could they be doing as part of the requirements to fulfill the nine uh, First Fridays for nine months? Our Lord Jesus Christ in the 12th promise, the last promise that he made of the series, he promised to, for people, for those who receive Holy Communion, of course, in the state of grace, mm -hmm. of course, we presuppose that uh, there's confession before, with a sincere desire to amend our sins, when we receive Holy Communion on the first Friday of nine consecutive months, he will promise that we will not die without receiving our sacraments. Look, this is the most biggest promise ever. Yes. We will we'll not die without receiving our sacraments. So even if you die on a first Friday, the last time you received your Holy Communion, your sacrament, was your viaticum, and you'll be in paradise. I know it sounds out of, out of fashion to speak about heaven, but that's one thing we're going to speak in due course. Very good. The contemplation of God's infinite beauty throughout eternity. That's what we exist. That's what we are created for. The contemplation of God's infinite beauty. That will be the subject of another, um, another one point. We, this this show is um, now a premiered on Good Friday for many of us or people watching. It's after Holy Thursday and it's Good Friday. What do they do on a day if they cannot receive communion today? Um, if it is the next possible day, does that I guess count? How does it work? For those who cannot receive, if it's not possible, if not possible to, to receive, come on, God does not demand the impossible. We receive the following day, ask a priest's permission, is a matter of effect, because God does not expect us to do the impossible. And uh, simple as that. The, the, the merciful heart of Jesus is just uh, that's a promise number six when he said, As soon as you find in my heart an infinite ocean of mercy. You see, we don't know the sacred heart of Jesus. That's what, God willing, in this, in this nine months here with you guys, we are going to have an, a better understanding of our Lord in this marvelous devotion. Yeah, fantastic. I want to thank you, Raymond. Um, I'm excited for the next eight. Uh, shall we close in prayer? Can I ask you to close in prayer as we sign off on this first of a nine-month series? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life and sweetness and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, Amen. most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this our exile, 
show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus, O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. See you next time. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone, for our first episode, Sacred Heart uh, Apologetics, and we'll be with you next month, the first Friday of every month, right up until December. Spread the word, and we'll see you next time. God bless.